get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I'm excited. It has been two years too too long. We have Dr. Joseph Michelli, New York Times number one best-selling author of books that include The Zappos Experience, Leading the Starbucks Way, The New Gold Standard about Ritz Carlton, When Fish Fly, and many more. And his newest book, which we're going to talk about, is Driven to Delight, Delivering World-Class Customer Experience, The Mercedes-Benz Way. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelli Joseph, for joining me. Hey, Jeremy, I'm not sure if it's been two years because you're just so dang popular and it's hard to get on your show or if it takes you <laughs> that long to write another book, one of the two. For you, it's never too hard. Um, and if anyone didn't listen to the last interview we did, um, you just talked about so many riveting things. There was one particular, you know, particular riveting tale of how you actually came into this world. That alone is worth listening to. And so people should go to Inspired Insider and actually just type in leading the Starbucks, leading the Starbucks way and check that out. But um, so I'm excited. And the first thing I, you know, we were talking about some, what's a crazy story from creating this book? What's interesting? And you were talking about sitting in the room. Uh, what happened? So I was, you know, I was part of the journey with Mercedes Benz in this transformation and they had done some foundational work on what it takes to be successful in delighting people in work or otherwise. Yeah. And it really was a simple concept. It was an acronym called LEAD and it was focused on listening and, and that was really active listening, not just kind of hearing. Uh, and then there was this empathy element and there was adding value and then there was this extra little bit which we call delight and that acronym stood for lead right mm. so we had that in place it had been rolled out everything was going with that and then we're developing this really cool program where we're bringing you know employees in from all over the world to this very special place and we're wanting to develop this extra special training program and I'm in this room and all these people are writing on the board and we're throwing out these ideas and we're getting excited and we have all kinds of new concepts flowing and somebody just said what was wrong with lead? You know, like <laughs> just build on that and make it yeah. better and develop deeper skills there instead of throwing it all out and coming up with flavor of the day. And I just thought, wow, how often do I do that? How often do all of us like look for the new shiny toy instead of diving deeper into the things that are more substantive? Yeah. How long did it take to come up with that lead originally? You know, I think it was a long journey then. It was a little before I got there. I mean, it's certainly a concept that, you know, variations have been around, but it was mm -hmm. what was built into that culture. And I think your point's well taken. <laughs> like, there have been a whole bunch of people working on that for a long time, and it was good enough, and it, it really meant something in the culture. And then to throw it away just because we wanted to do something new, right? Right, right. Uh, and I think you can reposition old content and dive deeper and, now, the truths of the universe have been around forever, right? We're not creating a whole bunch of new stuff. It's just yeah. trying to make sure it connects with the hearts and minds of the people we're sending the messages to. Yeah, and I think we all do that as chasing that shiny object a lot of times. Um, yeah. So how did you decide to do the book on Mercedes-Benz? After going from Zappos to Starbucks. You know. I kind of got asked, not really to do the book, but asked to kind of help Mercedes-Benz mm. look at what was out there. So think about this brand. Mercedes-Benz is a rock star brand when it comes to automotive innovation, and yeah. they're a rock star brand when it comes to marketing. Uh, Luxury, they, yeah. All that much in a bag of chips around was the way they delivered the experience in the dealerships. Mm -hmm. And so I got asked by the CEO. He just uh, he just come out of their marketing channel and became the CEO of Mercedes-Benz, and his name is Steve Cannon, to come there and to bring with me some of the people from those other books uh, that you've talked about. Mm. Um, and so we brought in some executives from places like Ritz Carlton or Zappos and we had this round table discussion with Steve and I facilitated that and we had lots of leaders uh, from Mercedes Benz in the room as we were looking at how do we create, how does he create this best in class opportunity. And uh, from there, I just got involved with them in, in their journey of trying to tr transform the brand and chronicled it all the way along the journey and voila, a book was born. So. Put me, I'm a fly in the wall at this round table because this is one of my last questions, but you brought it up, so we'll go with it. I was really interested when I heard this. 
about what was talked about in that roundtable panel discussion with all these top executives at these, you know, customer services number one yeah. companies. Well, so what was talked about is the fact that most people want great customer experiences and most customers aren't getting them, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, th there's research out there in the Forrester group that says 92% of corporate leadership teams out there are trying to improve the customer experience. It's one of their strategic priorities. And so clearly when we had this meeting, we said, Mercedes-Benz, you're on a journey that, you know, it's kind of a full path. 92% of all leadership teams want this. And so what they were looking for when they were talking to the Zappos or to the Ritz-Carlton folks is what's the difference between those who want it and those who actually execute? So the wannabes and mm. the true leaders. And if you look at it, and you look at like statistics right now, American Customer Satisfaction Index recently posted a customer satisfaction uh, you know, report card that basically says, despite all this prioritization, we're almost at the nine-year low on customer satisfaction. Wow, that's crazy. So, so everybody was prioritizing it, but not many are actually delivering it as far as customers are concerned. So that meeting was all about what's the difference between brands mm. that really get there and ones that just have it on their wish list for Christmas. So what were people saying about how to execute? Easy, multi-year involvement. So you have like to, easy, but very hard, right? All you got to do is all you got to do is commit your soul and your heart <laughs> to it, and you're good. Um, right. Yeah, it starts with a multi-year plan. So rather than seeing it as a transition or an initiative or whatever, it really is a transformation. So that was one of the key learnings I think that came out of that mm -hmm. meeting, um, and it really meant that you had to leverage probably three key drivers to make it happen. It was people, it was process, and it was technology. Mm -hmm. And unless you could get your arms around each of those channels successfully, yeah. Yeah. you could never really deliver it. So that's kind of where it started. And, yeah. and thus, you know, you see the book just kind of starts to lay out right out of those meetings. Yeah, and we'll talk about the technology component later because I love that part about the book, actually. Um, but as far as what do you think, what did you and Steve walk away with after that, that was a big takeaway that, okay, like obviously there's a lot of stuff that happens in the room, but there's something you have to s start doing first. What do you think that was I, for I him? I can tell you, I mean, I'm not sure what Steve took away, but I can yeah. honestly tell you what I did. Yeah. I, um, I had friends of mine who worked with Lexus and Lexus had always been known as the, the brand that delivered the customer experience. And there have been times when they'd reach out to me and say, you know, maybe someday you should come over and do a book about Lexus. And I thought, well, you know, that fits kind of with the Ritz Carlton and some of the other books, brands that have a long history of committing to it. Mm -hmm. What I took away was as soon as I left that meeting, I go, I'm betting on Steve Cannon because this guy is going to go in all in on it. His legacy mm -hmm. is linked to it. And I'd be interested in doing a variation from my typical book, which is the five principles for great companies who are already doing this, to a book more about how does a brand that's not known for this but right. has really passionate leaders go in the direction of turning it around. So hmm. I came away with uh, an interest to do a book, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Hence, that's what we're talking. Um, yeah. How hard was it to put together that roundtable? Because that seems like a, a big feat in itself. Uh, this is probably the side story, but you know, yeah. you got into my, my origin story in your last thing, yeah. so I'll be really personable with you about it. Um, my wife was in end stage cancer at the time, so I oh, was wow. pulling together my resources and my contacts, and, and I was saying to these people, you know, I may or may not even be able to be there for this. Can you not only commit to do it, but could you commit to do it in, the, in my potential absence, given my wife's situation? Wow. Yeah. And um, it just worked out. I think it was, I think the round table was about February 8th of 20, uh, 2013. Wow. And my wife died on February yeah. the 11th. So but I was sorry. To do the event, yes. get back and be present with her in the final hour. Mm. So, so there was an added side challenge. Um, but That's also, a challenge is putting it like as light as you possibly could put. I'm so sorry so, to hear that. No, I, I'm so blessed. But but the the message here was that the people that I had enlisted to do this with are such amazing servant leaders that they all embraced the willingness not only to share their wisdom mm -hmm. with Mercedes Benz, but they also would just nurtured me and, and helped me through that time as well when we did it. So the the round table was easy to put together yeah, uh, because okay. I, I had great service leaders who were willing to participate in. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember actually when we were talking about leading the Starbucks way, the really one thing that touched me about the book was the dedication part mm. uh, about your wife and your children, and everything like that. So yeah, I remember vividly 
um, you know, talking about that and, and being touched by that also. Yeah, I think so. the book should come out after, you know, it actually got published probably afterwards, but it was, you know, I got started with Mercedes before the Yeah. Release. So but how long has this journey been to complete the book? Well, from that day, right, from September 8th, uh, 2013 to, uh, wow. to just a few months ago, uh, the book was in some form of process. So some of it was working with Mercedes as they were doing the transformation and chronicling it. Other times it was just active writing, and then there's editing, which takes forever. Uh, but, yeah, it's been that whole journey in that time. What's the hardest part of the process for you? Of creating the book, you know, for me, it's always fun to write, and it's fun to be in the middle of the transformation. I hate editing. I hate the detailed stuff. I, you know, take any word you want, get rid of any of my words, put a different word in, it's fine. But this is the level of detail and obsession that people have around yeah. grammar. Uh, it's all good. It's important. But so, no, no. you know, just what's the process as far as talking to executives and customers and staff? Are there a certain number that you hit, like, I want to talk to 50 staff, or does it organically happen? How does that, that process work? You know, it's probably like an interview. You kind of drill for a while until you kind of see there's not a lot of there there anymore, and you kind of move on to something else. So it is self-limiting. Uh, uh, you get into some areas. And there's other areas where you just wish you could go on and on, but you realize the book would all be about one thing, mm -hmm. and it would be lopsided. So my goal is always to speak with senior leaders and really be intimate with the senior leadership team, understand them, know them, have lots of access, yeah. and then have access throughout the organization at each level down, and then track that all the way out to the customer. So I need to be able to reach out and talk to customers, um, frontline employees, people who may not see themselves as customer service or customer facing, uh, support people. So, uh, it, you know, really it's just the important thing is to have all those levels of interaction, not necessarily how many people you interact with at any given level. Yeah, yeah. So you start to see those patterns. You're like, okay, I think yeah. I'm at the bottom of the well here. I can go to the next thing. That Absolutely. makes sense. So what was eye-opening for you when talking to staff that you well, figured I out? But the first one was, you know, early in the process, it became clear that many people who at dealerships now realize a dealer is not Mercedes Benz USA. They're, Mercedes Benz USA is the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. Uh, and then you've got these independent business owners and in dealership arrangements with MBUSA. And those independent business owners hire staff, and their staff are in the dealership. What I didn't appreciate was that many of those staff in the dealership had never driven yeah. a Mercedes-Benz. Yeah. So here we are in this land where the sign out in front of them is so-and-so's Mercedes-Benz dealership, and the people inside have not driven a Mercedes-Benz. It's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, so that became a real target point, yes. particularly in that people phase yeah. of the yeah. journey, yes. to try to make that be different. This is one of my favorite stories stories in the book actually what the test drive initiative can you talk a little bit about that oh yeah i mean so they called it dash the the okay. original program and yeah so, so the goal was if and the numbers were variable but let's assume it's it upwards of 50 60 percent of people in a dealership had not driven a mercedes so if we're ever going to get people to understand the uniqueness the specialness of this vehicle they would have to drive them themselves. So mm -hmm. Mercedes-Benz went through this painful process of getting a, a large number of Mercedes-Benz vehicles available to every single employee in the dealership to take and drive for multiple days. Now, as they did that, I mean, people were taking, you know, they were just overjoyed to be driving these vehicles. And they right. were sharing stories of picking, you know, their daughter up, uh, you know, from the hospital in a Mercedes or taking their mom to a special <laughs> meal or, you know, right. going, taking their daughter to their wedding in this vehicle. Right. And so it really did touch staff to do it. Yeah. What was fascinating about it probably was that this is a car company, right? Getting cars to the employees of dealership should not have been a problem. Yeah. But it was a major nightmare because... It seems like you'd need tons and tons and tons of cars for this situation, yeah. Tons of cars, and then who's liable, right? Like, who's responsible when those cars go out and they get driven around? So yeah. literally, they had to use Hertz, and they had Hertz buy all of these wow. cars. And rent them back to the dealerships so that all of the rental agreement insurance issues were there. And then obviously that guaranteed Hertz 100% booking of those vehicles for a set period of time. Payment. Yeah, Hertz they, is like, all right, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, it worked out. But it, it, it wasn't as easy as I thought it might be in the original yeah. con concept of it. And it makes perfect sense. And I guarantee like I, I need to look at myself and everyone in their business is, 
what are we not practicing or, you know, practicing what we preach type of thing. Like if someone's in there, what are we not using? And we're, you know, selling this stuff. Like we should be using it or everyone around the product or service should be using it too. So that was an eye opening thing for me in the book. Yeah. And that's a cheap one, right? I mean, if you're a restaurant, let your people eat some of the food. You know, there's nothing like having a waiter and you go, well, what would you recommend? And they go, I'm sorry, I haven't tried any of this stuff. Right. Right. (laughs) I'm not allowed to eat the food here. So, (laughs) yeah. I wouldn't dare eat. The they serve me different food in the back. Yeah, exactly. I, I, there's a little dog bowl over there. They literally <laughs> lap out of every once in a while. So, what about eye opening with customers from a customer perspective? Wow. So, from a customer perspective, first off, people are loyal to this brand, and there's a whole bunch of people who are loyal to the brand, even though they told me terrible experiences they had in dealerships. Right. So, thank goodness their product was as good as it was, because sometimes people weren't treated in keeping with the product. The, the product and they stayed with brand anyway. But when you talk to, to customers who had turned away from the brand, yeah. you would typically say, I love the product. The product wasn't my problem. I just didn't like the way I was being treated when mm-hmm. I brought my car into service. Yeah. So it's kind of like I got a divorce from the brand even though I loved the product. Yeah. So I think realizing that as they really focused on making sure that the experience was best or nothing, just like the brand promise was for products and marketing. Yeah then I think you started to see customers saying, wow, I'm going to give it a try again, or I tried it again, and hey, this is, this is a different kind of experience. Not arrogant, not, you know, not, it's, it's just attentive to my needs in a way it didn't right. used to. Yeah, so I want to talk about the technology piece, which is interesting, but, but what were some of the things that people were, when you say terrible experience, you know, I felt like when I listened to the book, it was almost like, You can't have a terrible experience in your typical car dealership because it seemed like they were more just the product sells itself and they weren't pushing it, which I would think wouldn't be a bad experience for someone going to a car dealership and someone not pushing, you know, being pushy on it. Well, absolutely. On the sales side, experiences weren't that bad, really, if you think about it, because that's a happy time. Uh, now, if you didn't buy a car from Mercedes, and part of the J.D. Power score is not only those who were satisfied after they bought it, how satisfied are you after you bought it, but all those who went into a dealership and didn't buy from you and went and bought somewhere else, or right. rejectors, as right, we call right, right. And people who rejected the brand often felt like that people didn't really connect with them, that maybe there was a sense that you can't buy this car, so, I mean, the pretty woman sort of thing, if you remember the movie where sure. she goes on Rodeo Boulevard and she's not treated at right, the Right, that's a, exactly. They, they don't take her seriously type of thing. Yeah. Exactly. So whatever it was, maybe you were young, it didn't look like you were positioned to buy the car, whatever mm-hmm. it might have been, I think there was some improvement in those aspects, but really the problems happen more after the honeymoon is over mm-hmm. from buying are. It's in that service drive. It's in the way service is done. And I think one of the key things is Mercedes-Benz just didn't have a way of appreciating and truly valuing the time of their customers. So what they ended up doing, I think, was thinking that luxury can't be fast. Right? Luxury has to be kind of slow and nurturing, right? Uh, but in truth, you know, luxury customers have busy lives and they want to be able to use their you know, technology devices, for example, to get things taken care of quickly. Yeah. So talk about one of the or the technology that that Mercedes Benz actually implemented. That also didn't seem like an easy task. No, well, and again, this is not the strength of the company, right? Mm -hmm. I I go into businesses all the time, and you can almost tell the core competencies of businesses. I mean, they've overdeveloped their muscles in certain areas and maybe underdeveloped their muscles in some other areas. When it comes to engineering innovation, oh my goodness, these Mercedes-Benz are just massive computers that are amazing. Uh, And I've been on the test tracks and the off-road tracks with these vehicles, and I can tell you they do some humanly crazy things. But when it came to the way in which they deployed technology, to integrate and integrate and make the life of the customer easier, they were a little on the low curve, right? So yeah. they didn't even have what you know, kind of express service for the longest time. So yeah. whereas kind of mass market providers would be able to give you an express lube service, that was not part of the psychology of Mercedes. Mm-hmm. So couldn't schedule online to get an express service at a Mercedes dealer. And all that had to get changed. And it really did take a lot of working together with the dealer board and making sure that they could get the rest of the dealer body to support these initiatives. And they have done it. They've deployed them. They roll out quickly. And they've got some very interesting and exciting technologies in the service lane right now. Yeah, it sounded like they even hired a company that did, I don't know if it was apps or something for Apple and like big companies. Right. Medall- they, they hired Medallia to get Medallia. 
uh, right. yeah, real time data on how customers were perceiving all these different touch points, some technological, some human along the journey. Yeah. So my favorite story in the book about this is actually um, the seatbelt story. J Jeremy, do you ever realize how few people who interview us actually ever read these books? I mean, it's so exciting to people that right. people uh, do these things. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, I think there there are so many stories in this book from customers and from from uh, you know from the service providers as well that you know we all kind of carry our favorite stories about. But you know, maybe you can tell me which which seatbelt story. So the seatbelt story, the I think. Um, Someone had service, and I think the app, the technology component, um, said, you know, were you satisfied? Did we fit all your needs after oh, yeah. they already had the service? And then he said no. Right. And then it like there was like a seatbelt issue, and then 10 minutes later, someone called them back from the service and came to his house right. and fixed it. But I think the background story to that, right, there was someone else there who – observe this, right? So what, what was happening? Yeah, so it's interesting. The guy from Medallia was the one who was telling the story. So Medallia is the company that does this real-time listening and helps companies get that data quickly and then right. leverage it to help their customer. Right. So this guy from Medallia was having dinner at someone's house, having cocktails, I think it was. Oh, I didn't realize it was a guy from Medallia. Okay. The cocktail hour, his wife had been notified via a text message asking her if the service on the Mercedes had been to her satisfaction that day. She responded, no, no additional details communicated within minutes the service advisor from Mercedes had called to the house and determined the problem was the seatbelt the service advisor sent a technician to their house and before dinner was completed that seatbelt had been taken care of in the driveway of the owner's home was well, interesting the owner I think uh, was interested in that type of technology for his own business mm. so that he could be as responsive to his customers right. as Mercedes had been any new medallia was involved. So right. that's the, the kind of closed loop aspect. Yeah. I didn't realize the person the there. For all of us is how effectively are we listening to our customers? How do we take their feedback right. and leverage it? Not only to solve their individual problem, which happened in that case, but how do we have such a disciplined focus on listening that we can fix our broken processes pretty quickly? Yeah. And it goes back to what you were talking about, about the round table is they really executed to the nth degree on implementing it and actually doing it for the customer so that's absolutely really and, and i'm not to say there aren't breakdowns now and there you know this is not a perfect journey but the amount of all in and obsession and customer listening and leveraging the voice of the customer it's just such a different world than the old days of mercedes-benz yeah you yeah play. so talk about the best or nothing for mercedes uh, what does that mean like how do they uh, there's one story also in the book about how they admitted a failure which i like too yeah, well, ultimately, the best or nothing is the early days, you know, slogan of this brand. It's been around forever. Uh, it's like you know, BMW is the ultimate driving machine. Yeah. Um, and but if you're going to claim you're the best or nothing, if that's your aspiration, then yeah. you better constantly be aspiring to be the best. And if yeah. you're not achieving against that aspiration, you need yeah. to up your game. And so they were arguably the best or nothing when it comes to you know the actual integrity of the vehicle and the, the innovation. Um, you couldn't argue they were the best or nothing in the service experience. And so yeah. that became a rallying cry for the brand, which is, you know, we need to bring the customer experience to a best or nothing standard, just like our vehicles are. And then there was that failure point that they admitted a failure. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, they spent a lot of money uh, with an outside agency that they had trying to help them come up with defining the Mercedes-Benz way, right? And then everybody, so if you came into the reception area, that receptionist at the dealership would be kind of the charge of first impressions and she'd have, he or she would have certain responsibilities and that would be the Mercedes-Benz way. That would be so Mercedes, right? Just like at Nordstrom's when, you know, they come around the counter to hand you the, the gifts, that's so Nordstrom's. Yeah. Um, and they were looking to create those signature moments mm. And every department had their own way of relating to customers that was so well-defined. And unfortunately, they just weren't ready for that. I mean, they were still struggling to get things right on basic operational service issues. And yet they were aspiring to do this thing. So 
uh, Harry Heinekamp, who's the guy who's in charge of the customer experience over there, describes it, and I think he may even be quoting Steve in this, the Steve Cannon, the CEO, as oh, outrunning your supply line, right? So you were kind of out there without any infrastructure support to actually make that successful. But they realized that they, they got out there and they pulled it back. And you know, Steve writes this very clear message that even though we were trying to go out here on this uh, initiative, it was it was before it's time. Right. And now they come back around and they're actually able to do some of that and they're in that process of, of defining the Mercedes-Benz way. Yeah, I love that point because then you talk about how some people maybe just kind of muffle it, but they just came out and said, this didn't work. We spent a lot of time and money on it. You know? Yeah, I know. I think most people go beyond even muffling it out. They almost make it sound like a victory. You know, like we intended to fail. This is uh, we're so proud. I mean, it's it's amazing how much spin goes on in corporate America today. So when somebody kind of says, "Look, we tried, we failed. If we hadn't yeah. tried, we wouldn't have failed. And if we kept succeeding at everything we did, we're not trying hard enough at enough things, right?" Yeah. And, because failure is is important. You need to have some of that in your journey, or you're probably not reaching far enough. Yeah, yeah. Now, what's interesting about Mercedes or a big company like this that I think all of us can use is how do they communicate and execute, execute and implement across so many people and so many stores? Like if they could do it, then it's something that we all could be doing too. What did you find and how they actually, now that they have this initiative they want to go after, and how do they communicate to this just thousands of, of staff? Well, so part of it is kind of going back to that original moment I told you of our weird story where we kind of came back to the message instead of mm -hmm. just kind of creating a new message. And part of what I think they do is they, they bundle all this under the guise of Driven to Delight, which just so happens to be the name of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and Driven to Delight is everywhere, and it's always talked about, and it's, you know, it's communicated with a large message under a, a kind of a, a promise that's made from the brand to the employees that we will help you drive delight and right. hear the we commit to doing. And then we expect you to drive delight in everything you do. And how do you do that? You do that by listening, empathizing, adding value, and delighting. And here's how you do each of those steps. And everything just keeps spinning around that axle over and over again. And oh, by the way, we're going to drive that delight at all the key touch points along the customer journey. And we're going to help you map every one of those touch points. And we're going to ask you to look line of sight to what you can do at the high value touch points. And it just is like this tight, integrated message that you know, I, you almost at some point think, okay, I'm sick of driving to right. All right, you know, enough of that. I don't want to hear it anymore. But it's crazy. You can't. It seems like you can hardly over communicate in business today. Yeah. Once you think you're over communicating, you're you're probably just starting to get the message across. Right. Um, it's attention spans. It's competing messages. There's so many reasons it's hard to do. But brands and leaders who champion one cause consistently and tirelessly, I think are the ones who are moving the needle against that cause. Yeah. So you always like, how do they beat, I don't know, beat in that is like a strong word, but like that receptionist at the dealership who is, you know, disconnected from the executive team by, you know, 70 people, how do they get the word into, how does that pass along to, so she gets lead and gets, you know, driven to delay? They just hired Kevin Bacon. He's like only five degrees separated. <laughs> no, I, I think the actual answer is they understand how to cascade at one level at a time and yeah. hold accountability at the next level down, mm -hmm. right? So if I have on your charge that you're responsible for X number of people and you have to make sure that they deliver delight and we can get some metrics from their customers or we have other ways of measuring their performance – um, and I hold you accountable to that. Put that on your dashboard and then actually compensate you based on how effectively you lead that team. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how inspired people are to really deliver right. that kind of consistent execution. And if you cascade it all down to the organization that way. And the main grab they have is through their relationship with their dealers and partnering with their dealers to say, you know what? If you you can't delight our customers by virtue of the metrics we're asking then we're going to hold back some of the money that you know that occurs in the sale of each car. And when I say our customers, it really is a shared customer. It's the dealership's customer and it's the OEM's customer. If we can't collectively share our customers and deliver for them the best experience possible per Mercedes-Benz brand, then we're going to hold back some money that you'd otherwise get from your mm -hmm. car sales. Mm -hmm. And we'll use that money and give it to others who can do it. So right. we'll just recycle that money and the leaders of it will be the ones duly rewarded. 
Yeah. So what are some other, what's another great lesson you learned from the CEO, Steve at Mercedes-Benz or one of the executive team that still sticks with you? Well, Gareth Joyce, who um, was in charge of, he's a vice president of uh, customer services. He was a guy who, when we developed these very detailed customer experience maps, right? So they got they got developed uh, by the internal teams, and then Razorfish uh, came in and developed them. And when they got developed, it was him who said, "Wow, these are really complicated and very valuable at a strategic planning level. But how in the world can that person seven or ten degrees or a hundred degrees separated, as you describe it, how are they going to get?" their line of sight to the customer based on this level of detail. Yeah. And so he kind of crafted a sim simple wheel that helped understand the four phases of the typical customer journey in mm. each sector of the business. And he took that wheel forward and communicated it, and it really made a huge difference um, because great customer experience design people, we like to have really rich, detailed, <laughs> detailed maps. Right. He's just such a brilliant yeah. guy to say no. Yeah. Speaking of detailed maps, um, actually one of your blog posts has a cool infographic um, at the bottom, how to become a leader in customer experience. Um, and there were six takeaways that you talked about in that blog post. So I want to have you talk about one or two. And people can go to um, your site, josephmichelli.com backslash blog. And, and it's on there. It's from December 2nd. It's really good. People should check it out. Um, but you talked about good leaders, followers, aiming high, success with a closed mouth. Um, don't get caught without a map. Feedback is your friend. Obsess and share. Which one do you think would be most important to, to highlight? Uh, wow. Uh, you know, I think obsessing is important. Okay. You know, yeah. If you want your customers to, if you want your people to obsess about customers, you better obsess about your people. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't really care about relationships and people, don't tell your people to care about relationships and people. You know, I'll go into businesses frequently and I'll ask a manager, you know, tell me about your employees. Tell me how many kids they have. Tell me, you know, what their kids are into. And I can almost tell you, then if I back that up with an employee engagement metric, you know, mm. form measure how engaged are the employees in that department, you pretty much can know the ones who, who feel loved because somebody cares about them. Mm. Uh, versus those who don't. And then I can almost project what the customer engagement scores are going to be based on that too. Because really, really interesting. You don't engage your people, you don't engage, they don't engage your customers. Um, wow. And that, I think that's pretty pivotal for us all to think about. How much do we really care? Mm. How much do we really take a genuine and authentic interest in the people we serve? And if we don't do it, they're not going to do it. Yeah. That's so interesting, that one insight that you could have about that, and then it backs up all the way from the top to the customer experience. It does, and Steve really does care about his people. So how do you teach that? I mean, like, caring more. Like, now you say that, but let's say someone's all about, this executive's all about business, right? And they're right. like, I just want the bottom line. I don't want to memorize kids. You know, how do you infuse that? How do you... Um, I'd say you can achieve the bottom line then for a yeah. short period of time. Yeah. So your people. I mean, I agree with you, but I'm just playing devil's well, advocate for a you second. You know, some of it, if it's not in there, you probably can't teach it. You know, though, I think there are some really smart people who understand that what they want and how they go about getting it don't line up, and either mm -hmm. they make some changes in their lives right. and they fake it until they make it, or they really, you know, do a fundamental self inspection and say, "Wow, I'm not listening. I'm not paying attention. I think my projects are more important than my people." Um, unless they do that self-awareness, they tend not to have sustained success. Again, short-term success, lots of people can create it. You, know, you can yell your way and scream your way and throw things at people. For a short period of time, they might perform for you out of fear. And then at some point, the good ones will churn and, and you won't have anybody to really make mm -hmm. it. So. Mm -hmm. so, Joseph, what insights did you get uh, from the daily life of a top CEO? Like seeing Steve up close and personal, what did you see? I just I, I work with lots of CEOs and across yeah. lots of brands, and yeah. I think the universal truth is that for all of the maligning of CEOs that happens in the world, um, and I'm sure there are many who deserve it, and I'm sure there are many greed and avarice and all kinds of stuff going on there. I think about the responsibilities that most CEOs have. Yeah, you know, they have yeah. regulatory issues, they have stakeholders to appease. You know, those can be in the form of shareholders. They can be in form of, you know, in Steve's case, all those dealer partners who have to make a profit and make a living. He has to sell cars for the German, you know, for the for the German parent company Daimler. Right. Uh, he has to inspire and lead his people. He has to be able to do his media, you know, communications. Um, you know, he's he has to problem solve, crisis manage. 
uh, make big decisions that position right. the brand for the future. I find most of the CEOs that I encounter phenomenal human beings. And the only question I ever have is how they balance their lives right. yeah. between all of the responsibilities of their corporate and their personal life. Because it, it's just What so do good. people say? How do they do it? Well, you know, I, I mean, some of them are very creative and their family members travel with them and participate actively. I think they do develop, the, the really good ones develop some types of control around their lives so that other parts of their leadership team can take responsibility for certain parts of that uh, and that they can free themselves to just have some time to recreate yeah. or recreate. Yeah. What about, what's some interesting facts that you uncovered with the history from the parent company, from Daimler, that would be interesting to talk about? Well, I think that, you know, Daimler had a period there not too, too long ago where they, they welded with Chrysler. It wasn't good for either of the brands. I think they they thought that they could bring in different markets and meld together in a way that didn't work out. Coming out of that in the United States, they had also had some quality issues. And so there was a lot of morale issues that were in play prior to all of this driven to delight era. And I think one of the beautiful things, long before Steve took the helm, was that the brand had focused on its people. They worked on engaging their teams after the aftermath, if you will. And because they really did a good job of empowering their employees at the corporate headquarters, the time was right to focus on customer experience, right? Mm -hmm. They took care of their people and then they had a foundation of saying, okay, guys, we're going for this hill. Let's be the best in the world at customer experience. Yeah. I mean, so obviously, I mean, there's a huge overlap with the companies you've written about, Starbucks, Zappos, Ritz Carlton, Mercedes, it just luxury, top of the line, great customer experience. What do you see as some of the big differences between them? You know, these brands are very different. Like if you walked mm -hmm. into the corporate headquarters at Ritz Carlton yeah. um, in Chevy Chase, Maryland, it's very formal and very gravitas. And they're so wonderful people. I mean, but they are formal. And you go to Zappos and they are wackadoodle. <laughs> uh, you know, you might have a, you know, you, Tony Shea might just come out and, you know, do a shot, you know, in the, in the waiting area. So you just never know what you're going to get. And they're all very right. different. But I think what is clear is they all have a soul. You know, they all have a sense of who they are, what their, me their mission, vision, and values are. Right. And they operate within those. The values of a Ritz-Carlton, which is, you know, to basically create this elevated, enlivened sensory experience, are very different than Zappos where they're being fun and, and being a little weird. Right. So there's their souls are different. And, you know, Starbucks very much in the space of community and giving and connecting. And um, so so it's a real different vibe there, too, in Seattle when you go to the corporate office building, the old Sears building in Seattle. Um, so it's really different, but they're all deeply soulful. I, I don't know how to say that, but there are lots of brands I walk into. and It's like. God, they're so generic and plastic. I mean, I don't know what they stand for. I think they're so worried about offending anyone that they have no there there. And, you know, customers want to deal with real businesses. Even if they disagree with you ideologically, they respect you for mm -hmm. having principles. Yeah. So what's excited you most about this book? Because obviously you've written tons and tons of books. I've written a lot of them, haven't I? What, what yeah. do you think I did it right? So I think like, I listened to your When Fish Fly book on, on audio cassette. Like, wow, how, long, how old is that book? I mean, it's... Uh, well, that's really mean of you to ask that question. I really like you. Just, <laughs> way out of life. 2006. 2006. Was, okay. Was, yeah. So we're coming up on 10 years of, okay. of, since that book. That doesn't date you that much, 10 years. No. Um, well, this went from black to gray, I can tell you, <laughs> a period of time. Um, you know, what excites me about this book is that... I think the people at Mercedes-Benz USA are so right-hearted about what they're doing. I think they were very transparent about their journey. I loved being a part of it. And I'm excited about how that changes conversation in the automobile industry, which to me has always been kind of one of those, you know, going to the dentist kind of things. It's not a place I go to have an experience. <laughs> right. I try to avoid it's going good, to good. service on my vehicle. So good metaphor, to change yeah. that dynamic would be awesome. Yeah. So... Driven to delight with the journey of it, what's been most rewarding? What's been the most rewarding moment for you so far with it? Well, I, it's always probably the dedication, you know, or my acknowledgement section. For me, that's always the rewarding moment hmm. because at that time I get to look back. And in this acknowledgement, I talk about the treasures of my life. And um, I think that I just treasure the chance that people, this gets me all emotional, but that people entrust me to 
to ride along with them, either to tell their story or yeah. to help them with their story. Yeah. You know, we should never take for granted that anybody's going to want us tomorrow, right? And if somebody wanted us yesterday and they loved on us and let us help them grow, we should be so grateful. And for mm. me, I get a chance to do that when I sit back at the end of writing it and start acknowledging the people who either trusted me or, or supported me in the, yeah. in the journey of writing a book. Yeah. So how do you tell myself or someone else how do we practice that gratefulness or appreciation? Like, is there something that you put in your daily life that yeah. helps you practice that? Yeah, I just, there's a company I'm working with right now and I'm doing a, a weekly recognition form and I ask mm -hmm. all of the leaders, to, we literally track this for them, I mean, how sick is this? But we basically send out an email to all the leaders and say, here's your weekly notification, please just let me know if you gave someone recognition this week, was it in mm -hmm. the form of, you know, was it verbal, was it in an email, was yeah. it handwritten, um, and we don't really need you to know any more details, we're just wanting you to kind of check in mm -hmm. and verify. and. You know, it's not like we're going to slap anybody around, oh, you haven't recognized someone. Uh, but it's more to call awareness, to develop in the habit of yeah. being in a grateful posture. Right. Because um, without it, I mean, look, you've taken the time to interview Mimi. There's so many people out there who write books. And the fact that you take the time, I mean, it really is important. And it makes a difference. Hopefully for your, you know, your viewers as well, hopefully they get something out of this and they appreciate what you're bringing to the table. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate just having the opportunity yeah. to reach out to them through you. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it right back at you. And um, so I have one last question for you. Just so before I ask it, tell people where can they check out the book? Where can they get the book? What website should we point them towards? Sure. So for your people who are you know viewing on your uh, on your webinar, we can do it with a, a discount. So if they go to d to d book dot com, and then if they entered the code VIP, they would get um, something on the order. They get the book for about thirty percent off, and mm. they'd also get it signed by me, and then they'd be invited to their own exclusive mm. webinar. So that's awesome. That's the value add offering. So, so what's would, the? Just can you spell that out? The, sure, the site. D two D. So the letter D, and then the number two, mm -hmm. and then the next D uh, book dot com. Mm -hmm. And that'll allow them to, again, just access a purchase a page, which will have those discounts and those value adds attached to them. And do they have if to they put in VIP? Do they you know, have to enter in the term VIP on that page? VIP, like okay. as an important person. Okay. Uh, you know, they're watching you. So, um, but yeah, in addition to that, if they just want to learn about the book globally, not in, with any uh, intent to purchase, they could do that at driventodelight.com. Driventodelight.com. And that one happens to have the TO instead of the number two. So we like to confuse things as much as we can. <laughs> that's why so, I asked because two could be. You know, so so D numeral two D book.com. You could enter in VIP or go to driven delight.com or they can go to your site, Joseph Michelli yeah. com or um, Amazon or I got it on audible, which I love. Um, yep. Do you have a book there that you could hold up? Like I obviously have it on audible. So no, I, I don't have a book yeah. handy. Try not. <laughs> so anyone <laughs> listening to this, you there can't you see this, but anyone watching the video, you can see this. So um, right. thank you. And so my last question, well, I guess I have one last question, but but anything else about the book that would be important to talk about before I ask? No, I, I you know, every time I sit down and write these things, I think about the audience more than anything else. I think about yeah. somebody, I always think about a dry cleaner somewhere. Honestly, I don't know why, I'm just kind of twisted, I guess. But I think about a dry cleaner somewhere, a small business owner, yeah. and they're wanting to improve the experience yeah. that customers have. Yeah. And so while I'm sitting with a multinational company and CEO of this grand company, I'm thinking, what is he saying that could relate to the dry right. cleaner or maybe a mid-sized business? So hopefully, hopefully uh, people in that group get something out of the book yeah. because that's who that's written for. Yeah. So when you're thinking of that dry cleaner and that small business, what do you think is something that they can implement quickly or they should start implementing? Yeah, you know, I think it, you should certainly let them know kind of the importance of inspiring your people to care about people, mm -hmm. right? At the, that's the cheapest thing you can do. It, you should be hiring for the kind of people who can do it, but you should also be constantly telling the story of what does an awesome experience look like at my dry cleaner and why are we a special place and why can you make a special difference in the life of the person who's about to drive up right now um, because you could miss the opportunity to delight them. And how, wouldn't that be tragic? You know, wouldn't it be tragic? And so I think... Hopefully, they'll get some of that out of this book. Yeah. So, Driven to Delight is your focus, obviously. 
But so my last question is I'm always curious about what's next. What's um, I know you have probably have notebooks and notebooks of other companies or things, people, other companies having you come in and helping with their customer experience. What, uh, what's next? Well, I think the inspired insider has already been taken as a, you know, your <laughs> option. I, mean, it's I can do a blog or, you know, podcast or vi- webinar about that. Um, you know, I, I have many companies that I work with right now I consult for. So yeah. all of them are always candidates. I work with the Godiva chocolates and the Pandora jewelries and the Dairy Queens of the world. And, and so they're always in my mix of thinking maybe they'll be next. But um, there's one particular brand that I'm hoping mm-hmm. our journey gets us to where we need to be. And if mm-hmm. we are successful, then it'll probably be my next book in about two years. I can't produce these any sooner than two years. Well, that's what I mean, yeah. Work schedule in my writing it just takes me that long to kind of recoup from one book and get into the next and plus I'm a practitioner um, you know trying to do the consulting every day and then I speak about them so the book is just one of the vehicles by which I communicate or or try to help people so uh, another one in a couple years how much of a break do you need between finish because it's such a you have so much going on between finishing this one how goes for you know from the point it released it just released this week so it'll be another six months of really marketing the book actively and then about six months of break and then start looking at the next book yeah joseph it's always a pleasure thank you so much let's do this again in two years what do you say amen i have a, a i don't even want to say the company now but i have like a company circled on my notes i'm like oh this is obviously his next one here. Well, you 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 slip that to me under the you know under the yeah. camp, and we'll uh, we'll make it. I don't happen. want to like if it is the next company. I don't want to divulge it and put you on a spot like. Well, no, I'd I'd love for you to you know to let me know sometime, and then I'll verify whether this, it's likely or not, so you can have the insider angle on it. This is my know. prediction. I have it here. So, okay, but enough. everyone should go check out the book, Driven to Delight. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Between my eyes, walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.